back to Martin's and More. My name is Mari Rutsch. And I am Spoon Phillips. And you're listening to the thrilling conclusion of Martin Fest 2023 <laughs> recap. Spoon, we have so much to talk about, we couldn't fit it in one episode. Where did we leave off? Well, I think we're about to start talking about the great guitars, and it's a perfect time for the second installment of 20 Questions, wherein I get to think of a guitar that appeared at Martin Fest. Not necessarily a guitar that's available for sale at Martin now, but it might possibly be. But this was a memorable guitar at Martin Fest, and the Swami, Mari Rich, gets 20 questions to try to figure out what that guitar is, and up to three of those questions can be guesses of a model. Now, I had to guess multiple models to get the CEO 9, which was the very cool guitar that uh, Mari had in his mind in our previous episode. CEO 9 is made with really amazing curly mango wood backsides and top. It's been discontinued, but you can probably find it find it out there online still. It's similar to the CEO 7 being a slope shoulder 00 or a 00L as they call them and really cool guitar. So I am concentrating on a guitar that was at Martin Fest 2023. Go. Is this guitar a dreadnought? No, that's one. It is not a dreadnought. Was this guitar owned by a Martin Fest guest? Yes. Well, if you mean like a regular member, yes. We didn't have any special guests this year. So, yes, it's owned by a UMGF member that was at Martin Fest. I was asking because I thought you might be including the guitars on display at Martin on Main at the Martin booth. <laughs> you know me so well. But I yes, it, is, it was in fact a guitar that somebody brought to Martin Fest that was a participant of Martin Fest. Did I play this guitar at this Martin Fest? I have no idea. I'm not going to give you that one back because I wasn't with you the whole time. There's no way I would know the answer to that. So that doesn't count. Can I ask, did I play it in front of you? Not that I remember. So that's three. Is this guitar an OM or, yeah, is this guitar an OM size? No, that's four. Is this guitar a Martin? Yes. Does this guitar have a spruce top? Yes, this guitar has a spruce top, that's six. Do I own this guitar? No, that's seven. And I like the way you think, because I'm thinking some of the reasons you ask questions are about specific guitars that I almost chose. <laughs> <laughs> does this guitar have style 45 styling? No, it does not. That's eight. Is this guitar older than 1980? Yes, that's nine. This guitar is older than 1980. <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> Does this guitar have regular tuning machines now, but used to have banjo tuners? No, but that was a great guitar too, wasn't it? That, that was, was Rolex OM 18 Golden Era. We're going to talk about that later. All right, that's 10. We are halfway there. Does this guitar have rosewood back and sides? Yes, that's 11. It does have rosewood back and sides. It's non-dreadnought, non-OM. Wow. Does this guitar have an M body size? No, but another great guess. That's 12. Boy, you're really going to kick yourself. That's 12. <laughs> Does this guitar have six strings? No, it does not. That's 13, lucky 13. Does this guitar have 12 strings? No, it does not, 14. Does this guitar have four strings? Yes, 15. 
Name that guitar. I don't know that I saw this. You don't think you saw this? I can't believe you weren't in the, in the room at some point with this. Is it a bass? No, it is not a bass. Six, uh, that's 16. Oh, is, is this guitar used to be owned by Sky and over the weekend Brittany bought it and it's in tenor? Ding, 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 ding. We have a winner. <laughs> Yes, it's a 521T, a size 5 tenor guitar made in 1928 in what appears to be amazing, perfect, original condition, banjo tuners, um, and beautiful uh, Brazilian rosewood with the saw marks, you know, old vintage, you know, old growth Brazilian rosewood. Beautiful spruce top, four p. Uh, you know, and and Brittany. For those of you who do not know, Brittany from Raven and Red plays the fiddle and guitar and banjo and so on. But but it's so basically she can keep it in the violin tuning, and uh, check her out on YouTube uh, and Maury's uh, videos because there, she's there playing. I don't remember what what fiddle tune it is, but she's playing it on her brand, on her new amazing 521, you know, old style 21 with the, just like my TSP model and uh, with the four strings, beautiful, sounds beautiful, really, really cool. And her partner, uh, Mitchell, has a baritone guitar, so they're going to work very well together. Congratulations, Mari, for figuring that out. <laughs> I thought that was mahogany, and I, I had it in my mind that that's got to be in the running, but it's not rosewood, so what did I miss? And then I thought, no way did I miss somebody playing bass Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. <laughs> but yes, it was owned, yeah, Sky owned it, but her, you know, ever maturing hands, it's just, the neck's just too skinny for her. And so um, the, Mart the Mart Museum was really interested in it. Mike Dickinson was seriously you know, reaching ah. out to higher ups to see if they wanted to buy it for the museum. But, uh, but it fun fact, the video that you're going to find on our website where Brittany's playing it was moments after, I mean, 30 seconds after she said, I, I, I think I'm going to buy it. She basically said, I want to buy it and then started playing. So I captured the first moment of her owning that the tenor guitar on camera. It was pretty fun. Well, they just became engaged and I know when she saw it, she saw it, and they, I know they were thinking that, you know, expenses and could they really afford it and all this stuff. They, you know, and they recently moved to New York City from Nashville and all that, but it had to be. She fell absolutely in love with it, and, and he, having recently become engaged, could deny her nothing. <laughs> so congratulations, Brittany <laughs> and Mitchell. So, yeah, that was 20 questions. All right. So, and that... One of the reasons I chose it is it didn't make my three guitar limit that I was going to mention. So uh, let's hear what uh, guitars that you remember. Well, one of the, my most memorable guitars goes part and parcel with one of my most memorable music memories. That's easy to say. Danielle, Redbird Danielle, the big, big, big voice of Danielle. It should be no secret. She needs a guitar with a big voice. And she brought a D35. It's a garden variety D35. And if I remember correctly, it was just something from the 90s. It wasn't anything from way, way back. And it, nothing special about its age. But, oh, my God, was it powerful and broken in. And maybe when you sing like that, your guitar just starts to shake in fear so much that it <laughs> ages faster. I don't know. But if anybody listening to this program was in that hotel that, that weekend and you heard her voice and that guitar, you know what I'm talking about. So that's the first one. Yeah, um, absolutely. Very. That was a lucky find. It clearly had a, ma a magical top, a great top. And I like your, you know, you say you can put your guitars in front of stereo speakers and and it'll help break in the top <laughs> well she she is a stereo in her of her in and of herself so yeah absolutely all right well i'm going to step in here and then say my my first one is bob hamilton's 1934 triple 28 it's a long scale 
a lot of people know that the OMs were retired. The very first 14 Fret Martins were the OMs, and the OM28 and the 18 and the and the 45. They, uh, when Martin decided to change all of their major models to 14 frets, they got rid of the OM moniker and they went back to triple O. But a triple O 28 from 1934 is the same thing as call, as, a, as an OM-28 would have been in 1934. And uh, I was surprised. He said that Greg Hutton's uh, research into the, into the ledgers showed that it was completed in October of 1934. That's much later into 34 that they were still making long-scale uh, triple O's. I was shocked to learn that. But it's one of my all-time favorite guitars. I got to play it again. Bob knows that, that I, uh, I wish it was mine. But uh, <laughs> but I, I he lets me visit with it once a year, so that was great. Next, my next guitar is Roeth's OM18 GE Gasp, a mahogany guitar, but it deserves it. I I kind of had expectations when he was talking about what he was bringing, and I got to hear that guitar a little more often than some others, and I I really like that. It threw me off for a moment because I thought when I picked it up, I think it was on Sunday night to play a song. I mistakenly thought it might have been his 0018V because I saw the tuners and I said, do you mind if I play your 0018 V? He said, no, <laughs> you can't, it's not here. So it, it wasn't that I got them completely mixed up, but looking at them from when you're in a big song circle and you see the back of the neck and the side of the headstock more than you see the top, uh, that was just a really good projective warm example of an OM18 GE. And if I could be candid, I mean, it's, it's our program. We could say whatever we want. Uh, some of the golden era mahogany guitars are too bright for me, but his was not. It had a nice, nice robust voice, in my opinion. Well, it's like 20 years old, and so it had, uh, it, uh, it's definitely have matured and a really nice warm bottom end and a very ethereal uh, high uh, end. Um, so, yeah, and it's ideal for the kind of music that he likes to play. Yeah, it's funny. I'll just very quickly say I looked over at somebody very quickly. You, you talk about that. I said, oh, is that from the 50s? <laughs> <laughs> and it was just a, you know, it was an OM28, but he had had the white tuners put on it, so I didn't even think it was pretty late at night. Ah. I had been, I'd been well into my libations by that time, but uh, you know, I didn't even notice the pickguard. And what I noticed was the white, was the white tuners, and I thought, oh, that's a 1950s Martin, isn't it? It's like, no, it's <laughs> like you know, 2008 or whatever it was. But anyway, oh geez. Um, and then I have to bring up Ed Madonio's uh, D45 conversion that yeah. we got to enjoy finally on Sunday night. This uh, started its life as a D28E, one of those electric, acoustic electrics that had the knobs in the top and stuff. And it was just the back and sides, Brazilian rosewood, and David Musselwhite converted it into a D45 with snowflakes that had a very special C Martin F headstock that was I absolutely identical to the C Martin F uh, headstock that was being used in the mid-1930s that has a little sort of curlier uh, f uh, font, you know, surfs to the font and all that. But boy, is that an amazing sounding guitar. The, the Adirondack Spruce on that is between 450 and 500 years old. <laughs> and and it was done, of course, with hide glue and, and has a 1930s, you know, 1937 style forward shifted bracing like an authentic. And, and he was very generous to let us play it. You know, uh, in the circle. So, he sure uh, was. Yeah, he let Lee play. For Lee from England, he let me play it. Um, did you get to play it? I didn't I get to know. play it, but I, I that's going to be in my regrets, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that was really super special, and it was really nice of him to bring it out and hand it around. Um, okay, you got another cool guitar? I have another, another guitar and an honorable mention. When I talk about guitars that really made my day, I've seen it before, and it's not that it was a brand new surprise, but Becca's D42, we only got to play a couple of songs on Sunday at the park. I got to hear that up close. It was Reese and Becca playing along with each other, and before I got to join them, I made it a point to, and this is tricky, when you get to Martin Fest, your first idea might be, quick, let me play with you. Don't do that, because then you don't get to hear the guitars as much as when you're playing your own. So I got to hear Becca's guitar. And then talk about another big voice and big, uh, big guitar companion piece. Well, we talked about Danielle. Uh, Becca's no slouch either, and she's got a big voice and a oh, big yeah. guitar. Yeah, you guys should check her out online too. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. Uh, I th think that was the only weekend she wasn't playing this year, so I'm glad she got to make the trip. And if I know her, she probably had a gig that night. She's just been so busy, and rightfully so. She's in my backyard too. I, I think if I'm being honest, 
I could probably go see Becca or Danielle anytime I want and not drive more than an hour. So I'm, I'm going to definitely look into doing that. Yeah. And she also performed at Martin on Main. That was great, too. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel bad. I saw you guys over there, over by the stairs, you know, kind of out of the way. So you weren't interrupting the open mic. And I said, I'm going to go over and play with those guys. And I never got out of the pavilion. Every time I tried to go, leave the pavilion, somebody stopped me. And, you know, and, and that's the way it goes. Um, I know. You know, uh, Alan, and uh, so my... Uh, you guys, you were going to say an honorable mention. What was your honorable mention? Uh, only because I don't know exactly know what it was, but Jim Murphy had a 1949 something or other. I got to play Lee Shore with him. Triple O 28. Triple it was O Triple O 28. That guitar. I did not get to play that. I'm sad to say, but me neither. I got to hear it, but didn't get to play it. But but I'm not so upset. I didn't get to play it because I got to hear him play it. And that, if I would have known that the name of that guitar, I might have included that in the first three. Yeah, while we were having dinner, we were eating our, you know, our Chinese food Sunday night because the restaurant was closed in the room where you guys came in and you were the dinner set. You guys did Guinevere, David Crosby's Guinevere together, and then you started tossing uh, songs back and forth. That was, you know, and talking, you know, talking shop about how to play David Crosby songs. That was wonderful. So we were great to, we were happy to be eavesdropping on all of that. Um, so I'm going to throw out uh, Dick Boak's Spruce Goose 12 fret dreadnought baritone guitar. Oh yeah, it's a mammoth. I picked that up when you were singing with uh, with Redbird, and you know, playing with Redbird, and and uh, I, you know, it was a baritone. I knew it was going to be in tune to B or B flat, and so I just kind of slid up and tried to do a little lick, and it happened to be in the right key. <laughs> So I started playing bass for her and then took a lead and stuff. And I was playing what would have been D. And D, you guys, I have no idea what you were playing in, but I was tuned down to B. But boy, I love that guitar. I would That's what guitar I would love to own. If I had the kind of money that you could do these things, I'd commission him to make a duplicate for me. I know he's never going to sell that guitar. But uh, a mammoth, he made a, he's got a pair of them. He didn't bring the 12-string. He's got a 12-string and, and a 6-string. And the 6-string... Just magnificent uh, spruce back and sides. You would, I always thought spruce would be too bright to use for back and sides. It has wonderful bass response. And, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so that was a, that's a mammoth, mammoth guitar with a mammoth voice to go along with that mammoth voice that we were playing along with. So, um, so give me two, at least two things of that, that you, you're glad you did, that you managed to do and that you're glad you did. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll gloss over these so not to sound sappy or sad, but I'm glad we got to see Frank Krupit, who's having a heck of a time uh, battling some medical issues, and I wasn't sure he was going to be able to make it. And not only did he make it on Sunday, he played at the trees, and he I think he stayed at the park later than me, so not to uh, you know get too totally serious, but to see Frank was feeling well enough to be there, one of our oldest friends from the earlier days. Frank, it's, it was so great to see you and Maria, and seeing really seeing Marshall. Marshall... It has it's got some health issues as well, and he wasn't sure how much he was going to do if he was going to pop in there Saturday night, say hellos, and then go to the, the Sunday service or uh, the trees and the picture. Like when somebody says, I'm not sure how I'm feeling, but I'll be there for a little bit, I have to expect him to like pop in, pop out, go for the group picture, maybe get there for the tree ceremony, and anything else is a bonus. So having that weekend come and go... And I know you guys might think, what's the big deal hanging out with Marshall? You're always with him. I'm always with him through a camera, and that's not enough. And I'm really glad that it might. It sounds a little bit funny talking about us. In the last episode, Spoon and I have been at Martin Fest together for 21 years, and it was the first year we stopped to make some music together on stage. It's just almost an afterthought. Since we know each other all this time, it kind of is like that old thing about the, the cobbler never puts new shoes on. It's, it was so nice to see Marshall, see Frank, and, and not not go without, because the alternative would have been so sad to wish they were there and, and be reaching out to them, and that's that's got to be listed, and I'm I'm glad. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, there's enough people that couldn't make it as it was, but, but like you said, in the case of both of these guys, and your, you know, Dork Brothers, is great to have a picture of the, you know, the Dork together with you and Reese and, and Frank and Marshall. <laughs> so that was great, yeah. too, yeah. Yes. You know, I had I said I was glad I spent uh, as much time with people I had not met before as I did with old friends. And sometimes I, I was bad about that in previous years where I'd say oh, nice to meet you stuff. But I was so eager to be with my old friends. I only see once a year that I, uh, you know, I certainly don't mean to give new people short shift. But but um, it was nice that uh, Richard Pine told me that several green dots uh, 
told them how welcome I made them feel. Told him how welcome I made them feel, and then oh, I good. really enjoyed uh, hanging out with Lee and and Ruth and and all the other uh, new people and John Galella, like I said, who I met briefly last year. But um, and then the other thing I was glad for was I got glad I got the ten dollar massage at Martin on Main at the street fair. The the apothecary there, like you know, health health herbologist kind of person. Uh, their shop was giving ten dollar fifteen minute massages and and that uh, right after my set and I have to say after carrying all that luggage and stuff it was uh, uh, I'm really glad and it makes me feel Kirby said the same thing he's like that's it I'm gonna get a massage once a month from now on <laughs> it's easier <laughs> said than done but it's my first massage yeah. in memory so that was it um, and and similar to the glad I'm my two I'm sorry I didn't I'm sorry I didn't get to more get to know more green dots better better there was a, a couple Bo and Ruth I only got to talk to them briefly and Redbird and Chrissy I you know I, I really didn't get to spend any time with them hanging out and talking and really learning more about them so and that's then that's just a name for people so um but um, and I also regret that I did not end up in a song circle with Reese Ord or Bob Hickley or Len Rosenberg or Steve Moritz or Nikki Korshak or Barry Bear. People that that again, you you know, people that you love and you only get to see once a year and it's like a family reunion. But I didn't get to make music with any of those people. So I'm going to they're on my list next year to single out. So so what about things that you were other things you were glad you did or sorry you didn't get around to doing? Well, the, yeah, the sorry I didn't. I, I'll tell you what. I, I, it's. I'm so twisted on this because I don't want to make this thing a checklist or a schedule or hey, at 7:30 I've got to go to this room and see this person. But shame on me because I'm I'm not good enough to look at the registration list. And if I was, it tells you who's going to be there and what day they're going to be there. So if I know someone's not going to be going back to the hotel on Sunday night, I got to find them Saturday. And if they're there Friday, and they're not going to be there Sunday. I, I am so sick of running into somebody in the hallway on Saturday saying, oh, we've got to do that. And we both mean it. And Steve Moritz is like, yeah, we, you know, we, we didn't get the jam yet. But one of these, if not, if not now, later, I saw Len in my hotel. You know, I want to see the D45. I was like, yeah, but I'll see you at the park. No, you won't. Everything that I think is going to happen <laughs> goes by too fast. Sad but true. And I know I'm, I'm trying to sound silly, but I'm so angry with myself for being uh, mismanaging my time because the, the names you just mentioned, I could have spent more time with the people that aren't going to be there Sunday night on Friday and, and Saturday. And it doesn't guarantee I would have bumped into the right people the rest of the weekend, but I gave myself like no chance to jam with Lynn or uh, him and Dennis were probably playing somewhere. And, and I could name any names I want to, I want to say. It's here, true. But, I saw Dennis long yeah. enough to say hi to him, uh, you know, at Martin's of Maine. And that was it. And then he wasn't mm -hmm. there. You know, Dallas Whalen, for those of you guys who don't know, wonderful uh, finger style player, uh, great, wonderful gentleman. And he and Len Rosenberg are Chet heads. They, they absolutely adore Chet, the music of Chet Atkins, and they're both exceptionally good at playing it. So it's always a treat to see them playing together. But, um, yeah. So, and my last, I'm sorry, I, I could tell you that I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't drink my first Jura slowly like everyone else in the room. They passed this thing around. They said, okay, three, two, one. Everybody goes and starts to slowly sip it. And I went, Yoop! and I thought, oh my God, that was awful. And they're like, you're done. And I forgot, you don't shoot scotch. You drink it and you sip it. And it was, it was okay the next night. But that, I'm, that might be what I'm most sorry about if I'm being truthful. Well, that's fascinating. I, uh, yeah, I was lucky to to bond with Lee very quickly over the Jura. For people who don't know, it's a single malt whiskey from the Isle of Jura. It's uh, not that well known. You can get it in the States, but I was shocked that it's not the same thing. I actually came home to make sure because I haven't had it in a while. I bought a bottle the moment I got home. What comes out of the bottle in the United States is not the same whiskey that's in the same bottle in the UK. And that's oh, really? really disappointing. It's it's quite sort of dumbed down for, I guess, the export market. It has no smoke to it whatsoever where there's the juror that we had. It's not peaty, but it's it's smoky. And... and um, not tremendously smoky. Somebody who drinks heavily smoked, smoky scotch might not even notice there was smoke in it. But uh, but it was definitely more complex, meatier, maltier. Uh, and so I'm pleased to know that in the sense that it, so that they haven't really uh, homogenized Jurid for broader appeal uh, at home. They've only done it for the export market. So I'm kind of glad I know that now, but I'm sad that I can't get 
the you know the genuine article. So I'll just say that. But um, well, I have some p poignant moments. Sunday, when you're talking about people who can only get there anymore, Mac Carter, the original head moderator that made the UMGF what it is, and Martin Fest, and it was his connection with Martin and living nearby Martin that got us really in with Martin. Or none of this would have happened. He's retired from the f you know running the forum a long time ago, but. Um, he came over the little bridge from the parking lot, started walking toward the pavilion, and somebody started clapping, and suddenly he got this full ovation as he walked <laughs> over. And, you know, I mean, this, is, this is like, you know, this was like Babe Ruth and Ruth Garrett coming to the microphone at, at uh, Jackie <laughs> Stadium, you know. That's what it was like for him just to be there, just to be there and sit there and be there for the photograph. Uh, yeah. It was a wonderful thing. The salmon shorts, the salmon shorts are here, yeah. Mikey Buna. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But also that same day, you mentioned Frank and Maria. Hang out with Frank and, and Mike Bueno, who could only be there on Sunday as well. And these two old guys, that old friends, that used to run the all-night Beatle jam, where on the last night, they would start playing Beatle songs at like 8 o'clock at night, maybe 9 o'clock at night, and go until dawn. For anybody yeah. who wanted to be there and sing the songs. And those guys knew the songs. I grew up, I know all the <laughs> words, but I never knew how to play them. And Frank knows how to play all the leads. And, and, and you were only allowed to have a song once. Somebody would come in and rec you know, request some Beatles song. They're like, nope, already been played. And it yeah. would still take all night to do it. So <laughs> to see so. both of those guys there, even, even for an afternoon, was wonderful. And then the most poignant um, for me personally was seeing uh, Roeth's uh, Shastri sit down at Song Circle next to me and and play my compositions it was extremely flattering as you might know and uh, you know just goose I just kept goosebumps thinking about it so uh, that those are my those are my poignant moments um, any anything else you would like to add the kind of moments that go straight to your heart well uh, some of the stuff you're saying I would echo it not to not to cheat or look at your paper but I don't want you to think that that wasn't pointing it to other people as well, including myself. To really watch that, uh, it's it's not really fair for me not to give you a different answer, but I don't want the listeners to think that that wasn't poignant for me because that that really, check, I mean, check it out. If, if you tell somebody to go to NASFest and they show up and they have a good time, you feel pretty satisfied. Like I told you, it's so much fun. And I usually do that. Somebody that lives around here and they drive 45 minutes and they stay for a couple hours, like that was cool. And that's satisfying. Well, to see someone like come from Ohio and whether he would say it or not, you know, you know, meet one of his musical inspirations and you guys are fast friends in a couple of days. It's, it's not even that, hey, you know, it was nice to do what you have to do to make him think that you're. No, he's, it's inclusive. It, everything that these people are going to start typing on these Facebook posts and the UMGF about how welcome they felt, it's because they are welcome. And for me to watch that from a distance, knowing that I have something to do with why he might have found your music. Everything else was done by him and you, but I know that when somebody says, you know, what about this Spoon Phillips CD, you, know, you never shut up about, well, that's as good as it is. It's, it's not me trying to sell one. It's telling people, if you like that kind of music and you don't go listen to this, you're missing out. And to see somebody take that idea and run as far as they did with it, it was very poignant for me. The only other poignant moment that I'll take in a little bit of a comedic direction was the pizza delivery of Kaludin by Spoon Phillips in the big, big, big room. <laughs> <laughs> you have to you have to know that our was it our friend Jim Adams that wanted to hear it? He requested you that you do that? Yes. Yes, Jim Adams who couldn't make it this year up from California wanted wanted me to play my composition, the Steeds of Culloden on uh Morris D forty five. And I hadn't played it in a long time, so so I was wondering how I was gonna get through it. But so we set up and, and just so you know, Mario was doing this throughout the whole weekend. He was having people sit down so he could capture people doing their music. And and uh, and so you can see those videos online, a lot of them. So I sit down, I start playing, and the first thing that happens is the woman from the front desk walks in because Mario's pizza had arrived. <laughs> <laughs> so pizza delivery interrupted the first take and then he goes off and I start to do the second take and somebody else walks in 
uh, behind me. And so I started another one. Eventually, people, so many people started coming in uh, to get stuff out of the room, like chairs and stuff out of the room and stuff, that I just persevered eventually. I just persevered on and, and made it through kind of a bumpy take. So I hope, I hope Jim enjoys that. But yes, that was pretty funny. Yeah. Let's be honest. It's poignant to me because of that. If, if we would have found a quiet room that stayed quiet and you did it in three takes, well, isn't it true you and I have done that sort of thing millions of times here at the store? I don't want to do that there. It was great that, you know, I, I think I know where they stored all the chairs for all the rooms. Let's go get them all. I'm like, now? But that's why it was great. You know, <laughs> Kirby's like, oh, I know where they keep them. Where's the lights? I'm like, and, and yet it's so funny because that whole room normally would house 60, 70, 80 people. We found it completely empty, found where the lights were. It was just Spoon <laughs> and the camera. This is too good to be true. And it immediately was, so... Yes, yes, indeed. It was, yeah, it was, it was fun. Just to step back to what you were saying about Roth and me, I'll just reiterate again that you had somebody come from Ohio who would not have even found the UMGF if it wasn't for you. Um, you have the uh, couple from England that came all the way from Cornwall who would have never, you know, found the UMGF or, or, come to Martin Fest if it wasn't for you. And then Lynn up in Connecticut, Rosalind, same thing. And all of them, she came down, and she's one of those ones that was, wasn't was prepared to actually play in front of other people, though her husband Paul did. But she's thoroughly convinced that she's coming down for the whole thing next year. <laughs> and I think all, all of the people we just mentioned that wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for Mari Rutsch are going to be coming to Martin Fest next year. Uh, if at all possible, and they're going to rent rooms for the entire weekend, and and be and they left there knowing that they are now one of us, <laughs> and uh, and you know they they are now forever touched by the the Martin Fest bug, and whether they can always come or not. So, so and then I ended this with it had to be their moment. So my had to be you had to be their moment was on the last real night Sunday night. About three o'clock in the morning, after Ed took his guitar to bed and everybody went away and the food was all gone, there were the the hardcores that were left over was Jim Fortner Mueller from Vermont, Diana, the lively Diana, as I like to call her, uh, um, Keller, Diana Keller from Seattle, and Kirby Statler from Phoenix, Arizona, and yours truly. And we were still trying to do songs. Well, mainly they were doing songs. I was kind of burning out. And somebody brought up the fact that somebody had performed, and it was Craig Meehan, and I think somebody else said that John Hall may have done it during the weekend too. But uh, a song, um, what's the guy's name? His last name's Troy. But anyway, he wrote a song called Chicken Riders in the Sky that's a parody of Ghost Riders <laughs> in the Sky. And he, then it was done in the song circle, and it prompted people to make, like, chicken bagawks and stuff during that. They started talking about it, and then they kind of made some chicken noises. And then Jim, almost in, like, a professorial way, started saying, you know, chickens, and he apparently had become very intimately acquainted with chickens, and their actual behavior, and he was explaining their behavior, almost like he was on a documentary. And then he starts going, Buck. And starts moving his head around the way chickens. And no. again, you have to be there and you have to know him. And Kirby starts la laughing until he can't breathe. And then, and as he's just finally calming down, we're all laughing. And granted, the, you know, there was a bottle of Talisker involved earlier. And, you know, and, and it was at three o'clock in the morning on the third night of being up this late. And all of a sudden, Diana stands up and puts her thumbs in her armpits to make chicken wings and starts walking. So strutting around the room with the head bobbing, and then she lets out this huge crow, and that just did that. We all lost it, and this then they went they went on for like a half an hour. Oh really? So, so yes, I mean it lasted a long time. Three normally mild mannered people going completely bonkers at three o'clock in the morning doing chicken impersonations, and Kirby got to the point where he couldn't. He was literally on the ground and complaining that his back hurt so much from laughing. And he got up and he calmed down and he said, he "said No chicken's going to make me laugh." <laughs> and then they all everybody just burst out again. So that sure. was my you had to be there. That was the last uh, thing. And we get back to the room about four fifteen, four twenty in the morning. And I look at my, and immediately all three of them started sending each other uh, chicken cartoons and chicken pictures. But uh, <laughs> and it went well into the. And then the next morning at breakfast, she came over and she pointed up into the room with this ominous look. And there above the juice machine was this picture of a chicken a photograph of a i chicken. remember but, <laughs> i saw that 
But yes, that was my had to be oh. there. If that doesn't make you want to come to Martin Fest, I don't know what will. Um, yeah, right. Do not miss the last part of the last night is the message there. My my had to be there a moment. It's it's similar. It was it began. It happened in the same place that your story began, but it was way earlier because I was awake for it. And it's probably not as funny as uh, some other stories, but it does fall into had to be there. Ed Modano playing those really really pretty songs on that D45 conversion. <laughs> and and uh, I yes. It, Part of part of I started part of it because I asked, you know, if you guys, if it's okay, I'll, I'll do a live stream so we could put something live up. And I didn't mean be quiet, but as soon as I said that, Ed Madonio, maybe even Dave Musselwhite were like, okay, we'll be quiet. And I remember it very vividly because it was only four days ago. And if I don't say it now, I'll forget it. But uh, it's Ed playing this guitar, and he wasn't even into the song for a minute, and his phone rings. So now everyone's made to be quiet. And everybody's listening to... It, it didn't just ring. It went... Bang! It was like startled everybody. And, yeah, uh, it's, it's not the modern 2023 iPhone ring. It's the old phone ring. Like, you know, like yeah, he's going to get in his car and crank up the and, car. Too. And he was playing this delicate Christopher Cross song called Nature of the Game that I had requested with his partial capo and you know, beautiful <laughs> voice. And, uh, and so the phone rings. But go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, me. but yeah, and that's that sets the stage well because it's not this song. It's a very very pretty pulls you in delicate thing. So very delicate on the guitar and this big loud you know the original phone whenever it was rings. It's like I'm sorry I got to get this and with I think I can't speak for you. I think he's gonna say hey hey oh, okay quick I'm 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 playing I'm on a live stream. He just picks the phone up like he's at home on the couch. Begins talking to his son. That's my kid. I gotta I gotta ask him something. And it's then I'm thinking should I should I certainly be live streaming this? <laughs> Is this gonna be something you don't want? It's you can still find it. It's, oh, that's it's, right. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Oh yeah. The subject matter. But you know the but, journalist that I want to be. I leave the camera running and it, it ends pretty quickly. And he gets back into it and. All credit to him. He can collect his thoughts and keep going. I mean, that would wreck anybody's performance and say, well, I tried, but now the mood's over. He goes to it again, and maybe one more minute into it, uh, 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 <laughs> it's an alarm on his phone, and then that makes everybody laugh even louder. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got to take my eye drops. So that's his alarm. So I this only has to happen one more time until I think, hmm, I have his number. I, I, I could call him now. So... <laughs> So I go to uh, Rosanna next to me, and I think, well, if you want to be initiated, there's no hazing at Martin Fest, but this would be perfect if I can trick her into feeling like she's tricked into pushing the button that sends this whole thing going. And I show her what I want to try to do, and she sees my phone that says Embedonio, it the call, and my pointer finger by it. And she's like, oh, my God, no. Well, Diana sees what I'm trying to do, and she comes over <laughs> <laughs> and can't wait to grab Rosanna's hand and make Rosanna's finger push this button. So we do call him again, and then it goes off again. But just the, the little inside humor where we could get Rosanna to feel like she's at fault for making the whole thing go sour and that that's it, it you had to be there because that might sound dumb to someone yes, else by that time yeah. yes talk about bonkers then yes everybody except ed knew it was in on it and uh mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he saw it but the, for me the creme de la creme was he looks at you and you just kind of roll your eyes over toward rosanna like gosh can you believe she did that <laughs> <laughs> and yet, and Rosanna was very, very nice, mild-mannered, you know, downright timid among uh, all these strangers. Um, exactly. But, yes, but she took it in stride. So, yes, yeah. that was great. That was very funny. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, for me, for, for Friday night, I went to the hotel. I did not, I, granted, I, you know, I had twisted my ankle and, and sprained my ankle, so I was not that mobile during, on this Martin Fest. And I was meant to, after seeing Dick's guitars, I went out in the hallway, and I never, the hallway that's between all those common rooms, I never got into any of the song circles. I got stuck out in the room where you and I and John Galella and other people were playing songs and stuff and talking, and I literally never got into any of the song circles. I was there until the end of the evening. Um, I was one of the last three, three people at the end, and um, though, they, though Diana and uh, Tom Moore Oh, not Tom Moore, I'm sorry, Mark Moore, the son of uh, local Pennsylvania celebrity Tom Moore, uh, was, uh, was the, they were the last two, really. And then, you know, Martin's mind was great. It was great performing with you, seeing all these people, even though it was a complete sauna. But then yeah. uh, 
Saturday night was a, you know, that's where I did. Uh, once, once a year, I will make sure I do the long song circle thing. And I sat down in a room at about seven o'clock. And other than quick breaks for, for refreshments or maybe look in to hear a song from the door or other people were doing in other rooms, I was there from seven until I went to bed at three o'clock. You know, wow. after three. That's, I, that's what I did Saturday night. I did a song circle, and which is one of the reasons I didn't get to play with a bunch of other people. I I chose that song circle, and, you know, and stragglers came in from other song circles late in the evening when the other ones wound down. But it still was a wonderful time. And then Sunday at the park with the with you know get, saying goodbye to everybody and doing the open mic there. That was wonderful. I got to play John Hall's amazing Wayne Henderson 14 fret. Uh, slope shoulder quadruple O and oh, yeah. at, that you know for my little stint the open mic um, and then Sunday night was the night where we just talked about where Ed sang and we passed around his guitar and had the Chinese food and then and then ended up you know, on the chicken ranch this is how this is how Martin Fest has slipped over the years Sunday night used to be an all night beetle jam with those two great guys singing Beatles songs until until we finally gave up the ghost and had to go to bed. And in the early days, it would literally last until the breakfast guy came in to set up the eggs in the old hotel. Yeah. And now what we have is chicken impersonations at the end of the evening. So a chicken <laughs> impersonation contest. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't say Martin Fest hasn't changed over the years, but, uh, but it was still I think next year might be worse. Absolutely hilarious. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Well, I yeah. hope you guys appreciated this stroll down Martin Fest memory lane. I'm already sad that it's over and it's only four days behind us, but I really want to thank you, Spoon, not just for being a part of Martin Fest this year, but every year and your willingness to sit down with me today and, and recap uh, all the fun we had. I do hope if you're listening to this program, whether or not you've ever been there before, please consider coming next time. We, If we got anything across in this episode, the love we have for our friends there and the, and the memories we make, uh, you can't be everywhere at once. I, I certainly do regret a ton of missed opportunities to play with some people, but then I would have missed the stuff that I did get. So I don't know how to rectify that, um, but it, it's just been so much fun. And uh, no matter whatever happens and how many people can't make it next year, how many new people show up, Spoon, I am lucky. Uh, you and I have been able to uh, enjoy it together over all these years. There hasn't been a year where we, we missed each other there. Well, absolutely. And we're lucky. We're part of the 21 Year Club, which is a shrinking group of people that have been to every single one of them, at least for one day. And you and I are there for almost all the days. Uh, for those of you who are not that familiar with the Unofficial Martin Guitar Forum, you should check it out. And there's a section that you'll see called Nazareth 2023. I have Spoon's Martin Fest Journal of Adventure there, where I'm sort of the unofficial historian, and I basically go through my entire experience, um, and I've done that for many, many years upon years. Um, and every time I've said I was not going to do it anymore, I get so much mail from people privately saying you have to because the years they can't make it or the people who can never go there actually read it and and say, you know, that they feel like they know all these people be, based on my report. So check it out if you want at umgf.org in the Nazareth 2023 section. So, yep. uh, and in much the same way, if you want to see some video footage, go to marismusic.com slash martinfest, and that's a shortcut URL that takes you to the most recent blog. If you poke around long enough, you'll certainly see a lot of highlights from years previous. But currently, as we're taping this program, that brings you to all 56 videos that I was able to capture and upload, and it, it doesn't make up for not being there. But uh, even if you were there, you might see something you didn't get to see in real life because you couldn't be there. And the only thing I want to ask you about, Spoon, before I go home... Uh, it's almost time to end this really fun show. I saw Reese Ord posted a, a really cool picture. You're talking about doing the Martin Fest Journal. And there's you in the middle of the Nazareth Square watching Martin on Main. And you have your laptop there. But it's taken at an angle where you can't see what the laptop's doing. And I can't find where that post went. But I was, I, I don't have enough yeah, time to Yeah, it's in there. It's in, he actually posted it in the thread of my journal. And, uh, you know, the comment threads. And, yeah, I was actually working on my report about... Uh, Saturday, I mean Friday night. While I was there on, on Saturday, you know Saturday, because because I have people who, uh, particularly Billy down in Florida, who can make it this year. He sits there Aww. waiting for that report, and he lets me know it. 
<laughs> so how am I doing, Billy? <laughs> how am I doing, Billy? I said, uh, yeah, yeah, it's true. Because I had said I was going to give it up back when we were at the old hotel, and he wrote me a letter. He said he's never been to Martin Fest. And he said, you have no idea what this means to me, or to have gone, you know, been following this all these years. And he finally, so that you know, the very next year, I I said, how am I doing, Billy? And then. The year after that, they actually came. He and, he and his wife actually came. Yeah, and, he's fun uh, too. And they've been to several of them now, but they couldn't come this year. But, but the uh, reason I'm asking is because I found a really cool picture of a of a Peppa Pig baby laptop that I wanted to put <laughs> under your picture. So Reese is bragging about what you're doing at Martin Fest, and you're really just playing on some two year old's little Fisher Price. You know, that's really. I gotta really find that funny. picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so I, I I won't. I won't go so far as to say that I know you own a Peppa Pig laptop, but it was a good guess. <laughs> hey, I'm me and Peppa go way back. My uh, <laughs> my sister's goddaughter, you know, grew up on Peppa Pig, so I, I got to see a lot of Peppa Pig. But uh, but yeah, I'd say I'm surprised my voice held out. You know, I really did lose my voice. I, I really roached my voice Friday night, stupidly singing. You know, I don't normally sing high harmony, but I was out there doing it with a bunch of people and. And uh, and by the time we were, and people will see when you see these videos, one of the things you're going to learn is you don't have to be Eric Clapton or Segovia to go into these song circles. These are people who are just playing music they like, and everybody's accepted. Uh, whether you can barely uh, play, you know, C and F and G, or whether you can, you know, pull off all of Bohemian Rhapsody ball by yourself, you know, abs everybody's exactly. absolutely welcome and extremely supportive, and in just simply enjoys the songs. You know, whether you're playing Chet Atkins singing an Andy Williams song, which happened, or the Monkees, or you know, Adele, <laughs> you know, and so and yeah. so on and so forth. But but uh, yeah, it'll take me a few days before my voice comes back, so I won't be speaking much after this. Podcast is over. But, uh, well, before we jinx everything and both lose our voices, why don't we take this opportunity to say from all of us at Maury's Music, thanks for listening. Hear you later. This has been a presentation of Maury's Music, your trusted source for Martin and Blue Ridge guitars. Find us online at maurysmusic.com. <laughs> <laughs>